Welcome to the Health Fix Podcast, where health junkies get their weekly fix of tips, tools, and techniques to have limitless energy, sharp minds, and fit physiques for life. Hey, health junkies. On this episode of the Health Fix Podcast, I'm interviewing Sage Dammers. He is the co-founder, CEO, product formulator, and master chocolatier of addictive wellness chocolates. So when I was at Bestier, I had this dream of creating a chocolate company where I added tonic adaptogenic herbs to my chocolates and I was literally helping heal the world with chocolates. Well, that never happened. But the good news is Sage created a company just like I had dreamed of. So I'm really excited to share this podcast with you because his concept of tonic herbalism using chocolate is like my ultimate jam. Now, what is tonic herbalism? What are adaptogens? Well, they are herbs that help you feel better. They like boost up what you need boosted. And in particular, there's this concept of the the three treasures in Chinese medicine. And, And they work on your nervous system. They work on your gut and cell health. And they work on your shen, which is known as like your spirit, your soul. So these are like holistic herbs and they're working in synergy in your chocolate. Now, how cool is that? So anyway, before I give all of it away, I better just introduce you to Sage so he can tell you all about his chocolates and how amazing it is to be able to add adaptogenic herbs to chocolate. I've tried all of his chocolates. They're super good, they're tasty. He's got a good thing going on here. So if you are looking to help support your chocolate addiction, look no further. So let's introduce you to Sage Dammers. Sage, welcome to the Health Fix Podcast. Thank you so much for having me on. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Oh my gosh. I have been waiting for this interview for a while because you sent me all your lovely chocolates and I'm trying them all and letting them just get, you know, get into my body and, and sucking on the chocolates and going, okay, which ones are like the best? And so we're going to talk about my favorite here in a second. But I, you're doing exactly what I wanted to do back in the day when I first got out of naturopath school, trying to educate folks on the, the concept of tonic herbal medicine versus I take this for a protocol and then it ends up in the back of my cabinet and then I take this for a protocol and it ends up in the back of the cabinet. It's the idea of what can I do on a daily basis to keep health going. So tell us what brought you to tonic herbalism? What brought you to chocolate? Give us your background story. I was growing up in Southern California as um, a a vegetarian and and not necessarily a healthy one, but not the worst one you could be. My parents raised us on mostly organic foods and we were not really eating fast food. So we weren't stopping off every day at Burger King and McDonald's on the way home from school. But there wasn't necessarily a whole lot of nutritional density and variety in our diet. So it was kind of like five nights a week of tofu and basmati rice and one night a week of pizza and one night a week of pasta. And that was about it on on repeat for um, quite a number of years. And my parents were doing the best they could with the time and knowledge that they had trying to provide for a family of three kids and, and put food on the table every night. I hold nothing against them. And they've given me so many mm-hmm. blessings in life. But I always kind of felt as I was growing up that there was some potential that I was missing out on, something I wasn't tapping into whether it was in academics or in sports, I would reach a certain level of high performance in both. I was pretty good. But there was always this next step forward that I couldn't figure out how to make. And I didn't know why. I didn't know what I was missing. I definitely felt, though, that something was missing. I didn't know, is it in, is it my genes? Is it my nutrition? Is it the way I'm eating? Because I knew I had a different diet than everybody else. That was one thing I knew for sure. I didn't know any other vegetarians. And so this is, hmm, I wonder if it's got something to do with the inputs of what's going on here. And the really cool thing is that my parents had a wellness center going back into the early 2000s. And they had their infrared saunas way before this was the cool thing that was popping up everywhere. They had uh, infrared heated jade massage beds. They had some different practitioners working there, a naturopathic physician. And they had also a little uh, kind of kitchen with uh, selling different supplements and superfoods. And so 
I started seeing what was going on there. And I would see these older folks, you know, in the second half of life, let's say between 40 and 65 coming in and having all kinds of health problems, you know, whether it was low back pain, neck pain, um, arthritis, or maybe dealing with some things like Lyme disease or all kinds of issues, prostate problems, whatever. You, you saw the full gamut of it there. I was, I was, you know, 14, 15, 16, working the front desk. And they would come in and I would see them start to use some of these alternative modalities and get so much better. And I thought, wow, this is great. I'm so happy for them. And I started being exposed to this idea of an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of a cure and that you should get ahead of it and start cultivating your health way before things go wrong. Don't try to wait until it breaks and then try to fix your car by the side of the road as it's broken down. Do preventative maintenance and make sure it's optimized and change the oil, et cetera. So I realized that as awesome as this theory was, and as much as all these people coming in here and getting these great benefits believed in this theory of prevention versus waiting and curing, none of them had actually done it. They had all waited in their lives until things had started to fall apart. And then they had then they had started to seek out natural ways to put themselves back together, which is certainly op more optimal in my opinion than going the pharmaceutical and surgery route. But still, they were waiting until it went wrong and then looking for the cure, a natural one, right? But still, they were waiting. And so I started thinking, what if I really got onto all of this now? What if I started doing all these things now that these people are doing, but don't wait until I get sick? What if I'm a start at 16 and start doing everything I can for longevity and health optimization and anti-aging. What does that mean? What happens? I had no example of anybody who'd ever done this. So it was just in my imagination. Does this mean that I will live a lot longer? Does this mean I stop aging at 16? Does this mean I can maybe reach some higher levels of performance? The most exciting thing to me was, can I surf longer into my life? So surfing is my big passion. I see people surf and then they kind of peak around late twenties, early thirties, maybe in their ability, maybe even earlier. And then it's kind of a slow decline until fifties or sixties. And then you kind of stop seeing them in the water anymore. And maybe you spot them on the beach every now and then, and they tell you, Oh, I can't surf anymore. My back is all messed up. And so I thought, okay, what if this means I can peak in my sixties and then keep surfing way all the way through my life? And I hadn't heard the term health span before. It wasn't really popularized at that time, but I was essentially seeking a way to optimize my health span. And so I started taking infrared saunas. I started wanting to learn more about these different supplements that were going on there. And then one day, a gentleman from the local community came in who wanted to talk to my parents about selling his protein supplement product there. It was a mix of hemp protein and spirulina, chlorella, some other Western herbs like milk thistle. And... This was the first example of somebody who was the closest thing to what I had envisioned that could be possible for me in the sense that he was really healthy, really smart, incredibly smart, absolutely ripped in his 40s, looked like he was in his 20s. And <laughs> he was telling me that he was having this superfood mix twice a day for his meals. And I said, okay, this, I'm going to try it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dive into it head first. And I didn't know what I was doing. I was just blending up some frozen berries, uh, maybe a frozen banana, some Tropicana orange juice, and a couple scoops of this mix. And it tasted really, really, really bad. And so I was I was trying to make it as cold as possible so that it wouldn't be as flavorful. I was taking a straw and putting it all the way to the back of my throat so I wouldn't have to taste it. And I was just sucking this thing down. And... I started noticing after a few days that I would feel this incredible high afterwards, maybe a little bit with sugar rush from all that fruit going into the system by basically via an IV. But I think a lot of it was just giving my body a source of nutrition that I'd never had before. And so this really opened my eyes physically and metaphorically. And I started learning and researching more about every single ingredient that was in there and beyond. And the more I would learn, the more excited I would get to try new things and experiment with individual ingredients from around the world in the, in the realm of, uh, you know, superfoods and herbal ingredients. The more I would experiment with, the better I would feel. The better I would feel, the more excited I would get to go learn more. And it kicked off this cycle that never stopped. Uh, and, and now we're like 20 years later and I'm just as excited about it. And so as I was 
doing this and feeling so much better. I, of course, wanted to start sharing it with other people. You could only you know, spend so long doing something that's really beneficial for you before you want to start sharing it with your community. It's like the ancient um, hero's journey. If you go out and slay your personal dragon, you want to come back and, and share it with your community. Uh, the problem was my community at that time was high school guys and college guys who just wanted to party and get drunk and do, uh, you know, opioids. <laughs> I was like, oh gosh, what am I going to do about this? I can't really share it with them. So I started teaching like superfood smoothie classes at my parents' wellness center. Yes. And the, the audience was like, you know, in their in their 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and was having a great time, would pack the house there and was loving it. But I wouldn't talk to my friends about much of any of this. <laughs> and and it wasn't until I went on a surf trip with some friends to Costa Rica. And I, I brought my little uh, magic bullet blender with me and I, I brought my superfood powders and I would be in the in the corner of our little hostel hotel room blending up these drinks a couple of times a day. And I didn't say anything. I never wanted to be somebody pushing it. It was it was weird yeah. enough that I was going to all the parties and not drinking. It, I didn't want to take it to the next level of weird and be like saying, hey, you should try this weird superfood concoction of ingredients you've never heard of before. <laughs> So I didn't say anything, uh, but we would go out surfing and they would want to come in and be tired and need to eat and rest after a couple hours. And I would want to stay out in the water for four or five, six hours. And I was also taking astaxanthin so my I wouldn't get sunburned very easily. And so I was just like, let's, let's stay out here. Come on. The waves are great. It's beautiful. And they were like, no, nah, let's go in and have a break. And they noticed what I was doing in the corner of the hotel room there. And they said, hey, could you maybe try making me one of those before we go back out in the water? And this is kind of the moment I've been waiting for. <laughs> and I was like, yes, I can do it. Um, the problem was I had kind of become desensitized to the flavor by that time yeah. and forgot how much it tasted like dirt. And that, that became immediately apparent as soon as they tried to drink it. They were trying to choke this thing down. And the other thing is that when somebody who's quite toxic from the college party lifestyle, and especially this is like height of the opioid epidemic, when somebody consumes something that's quite powerfully detoxifying and they have a lot of toxins on board, sometimes you have what's called the Herxheimer effect and these things get flushed out back the way they came in. And so three out of the four of them were immediately vomiting. And so this really gave me pause. And I thought, <laughs> okay, if I'm going to really have a beneficial impact beyond just myself with my love for all of these things, I'm going to have to find a different way to deliver it. I'm going to, and I had this intention at the time. I didn't know how I would achieve it, but I said, if I'm going to deliver health and wellness to my friends, I have to figure out how to make it taste so good that people are going to want to eat and drink the things that I make just because it's an amazing food experience and just so happens to be massively healthy as an afterthought. And so that then led me to looking at cacao as this weird food that exists both in the world of what's really healthy and what's good for you, which is rare. Most things are either really tasty and not good for you or good for you. And like my smoothie, not really tasty. And this is one of those weird ones that exists in both worlds because people love chocolate. And it's also the highest natural source of magnesium, highest natural source of antioxidants. You got chromium, zinc, iron, then other neurotransmitter type compounds and great prebiotic fibers in there that have a huge impact on the gut microbiome. And so I started learning how to make chocolate, partially because it could be a cool gateway health food for my friends, and partially because I thought it would be a cool way to invite girls on a date and say, hey, let's let's hang out and make chocolate together. <laughs> Genius. Genius. Which is eventually how I got with my girlfriend, who I've now, as of uh, two days ago, been together with uh, for 12 years. So it worked. It worked. <laughs> awesome. Congratulations. Wow, 12 years. Woo. Thank you. And sorry for the long-winded story, but I... I uh, it was it was, a, it was a great journey to be on. You know what? These stories are what like bring life to the podcast, but also the story about giving your friends your, your juice. I mean, how many times have probably some folks listening to this right now taken something and then had a Herxheimer where whether they vomited, had diarrhea, they had rash on their whole body and they're like, oh, my yeah. God, this good food stuff is not good <laughs> for me. Bad. And it's such a shame when that happens because it can turn somebody off of taking healthy yeah. actions. They think oh, I was supposed to feel good from this. And now I'm throwing up and I have a rash all over my body. <laughs> so that's why I, I've learned over time. It's important to go in easy 
and and not try to throw the whole kitchen sink at somebody. It's it's true. It's true. And like, you know, we all learn it. Me as a newbie naturopath back in the day, I was so excited. I'd give people all these things and then they'd be like the next week, they'd be like, I don't, I feel worse. And I'm uh, like, oh no. You know, and so of course it like Debbie Downer for the doc too, right? So right. Yeah. You want them to have an, an amazing transformational experience. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. But chocolate, like this is this is the genius thing, you know. And and also when I was thinking about chocolate back in the day, I was like, what there most women, since I, I focus on women's health, of course, and optimization, you know, my thing was like, what woman doesn't like chocolate? But then I learned from my husband what guy doesn't because he's all in on the dark chocolate too. So genius, right? And and we crave it too, which I find fascinating right. as well. I'm sure you've heard the stories, seen, seen, had it yourself, maybe in terms of the cravings. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's a number of factors that can drive that. I think a lot of it is the nutritional density and the magnesium content. Mm -hmm. A lot of it is, I think, the neurotransmitters in there that make you feel happier. You have the, these things like anandamide, which is known as the bliss compound, or phenethylamine, which is the love bliss compound because it's what gets produced in the in the body when we're in love. So it has some amazing things going on there. And then you have the fact that it's a rare food with oil that melts pretty close to human body temperature. Most oils are either solid or liquid at that temperature. Not many go through the transition right at that temperature. So mm -hmm. it creates this in incredible mouthfeel that's so rare. Mm. That is one of the things that, you know, when I first learned about chocolate, right, when I was a kid, we had like Hershey's, right? Because mm -hmm. I grew up in the Midwest. That was kind of as, as bougie as it got until I got to West Coast and realized there may be other brands like Dove. <laughs> right. <laughs> No disrespect to any of these companies, but the point is, is like, you know, they're gateway, right? But I had no idea that how that tastes, taking a little piece of those and sucking on it compared to real chocolate, let's put it that way, and dark chocolate. I think there still is some chocolate in Hershey's. I don't know. Sorry, Hershey's, but is what it is. Um, we're not going to knock. <laughs> I'm going to knock them. We, we won't get bring you into it. But that, that mouthfeel, right? I never knew that you needed to suck on chocolate. To get I'm so glad full, you say that. The full I loved it from the effect. first moment you said that earlier. Yeah. It's it makes such a difference because when people just chew it as aggressively as they can and then swallow it, you're missing out on a lot of the magic there. If you let it come up to body temperature and then it starts to really release its full panel of flavors, it's going to be a whole different experience. And it's building willpower that way as well, I think, because you have to resist the urge just to chew, chew, chew. You just have to let it come up to temperature in your mouth and it's a it's a really like i think of it like wine tasting but for chocolate there's a there's a method there is and the different origins of where you get things i've noticed the longer you let it just sit in the mouth the more you can kind of pick out things whereas like wine to me i drink wine and i'm like yep tastes like wine the undertones and all that i can't tell but with the chocolate i can mm. so i'm guessing when you were looking for sourcing you were kind of testing a whole bunch of different ones. Absolutely. And, you know, growing up in the health world as I did, I had the great fortune to make a lot of amazing connections and I've spent a lot of time traveling around the world and and sourcing things. Happened to connect with some folks doing incredible things in Ecuador on the cacao front because there's a huge spectrum of ways that you can get cacao, a, a huge variety of, of, of quality and origin. And so you could get cacao coming from where Hershey's gets it in West Africa, where it's going to be grown on a plantation and you have very heavily hybridized beans that have been optimized. And even some Central American and South American beans are like this. It's a variety called CCN51, where they've been optimized for yield and they're known to have a flavor of acid dirt, which nobody enjoys. And so they're, they're constantly trying to figure out, you know, what can we do to this to make it taste good instead of just making high quality cacao to start with. And, and then you can have, of course, questionable labor sources, and it can be growing on a plantation in soil that's been very depleted in an environment that it, it didn't evolve to grow in. Or you could go to the complete opposite, which is what we do. And we have heirloom cacao that is wild grown. These aren't trees grown on a plantation or a farm. We work with a network of people who have access to these basically wild lands of these trees that have been growing there for decades. And so they all bring this cacao together from various areas that they have access to. And it's grown in super mineral rich volcanic soil. 
And the fact that it's wild is really special and magical to me because when something's growing on a farm, when it has a farmer and walls and fences and all kinds of man-made interventions to protect it, it's kind of like a kid that grows up with a helicopter parent. They might look all right, but as soon as the first adversity hits them, it, you realize they, they, they don't have much of a foundation to them. Whereas something that is wild grown, it has to survive out there in the survival of the fittest, competing with all these other plants for every ounce of resource, every ounce of nutrition in the soil, every bit of sunlight that's coming through the canopy. And so this, to me, is always going to be superior when you can get something wild grown as opposed to farm grown. And even with wild crafting, as they do of many herbs, you try to grow it in as semi-wild of a situation as possible, exposed to the elements instead of lab grown, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And then you have that and then process it in small batches very carefully, controlling temperatures so you don't damage a lot of the heat-sensitive compounds in cacao and also that you don't grow mold. And this is a big one, growing mold on chocolate because it's a something that's present in almost all cacao products out there. They often will roast it, which will kill the mold. But what you have left is the mycotoxins, which is the metabolic byproducts, aka the poop of the mold, which is what's really going to do you the most harm. And that is something that almost nobody talks about because not many people have a solution for it. And so the the big chocolate companies just kind of try to like, uh, don't st- let's not even go there. But yeah. our cacao is many times over third party tested to be completely free of mycotoxins. That's huge. Because I know a lot of patients, and myself included, after I felt like I had a mold exposure in my house, I started to have massive headaches eating chocolate. And I was using some higher quality brands, but they're mass produced, right? Yeah, and even some of the highest quality brands out there, I'm sorry to interrupt, even some of the Mm -hmm. highest quality brands out there, they still haven't sorted out the mycotoxin issue. Um, Even, you know, they could be certified organic. They could have all the right stuff going on in terms of checking a lot of these boxes, but the mycotoxins is a tricky one. Yeah. Yeah. And and here's the other thing about about that, that that I'm curious, because I just saw in the news, maybe like a week ago, something about this bug or or maybe it was mold. I don't know. Something. I I don't watch the news. Full disclosure. My dad was watching it and I cruised. It was very healthy. Very healthy to watch it. (laughs) I heard a blurb on chocolate, like like chocolate beans and, oh my gosh, where's my brain going with this? Deficient, deficient brain. Um, Need more of the energy chocolate right now. Um, <laughs> no, where it's going with that is that they they were talking about having, a, there's going to be a shortage of chocolate because right. of the crops. What What's the story on that? Did, did you catch that? Did you hear about that? Yeah, it's affecting the whole chocolate world. It's, it's a little yeah. bit crazy, kind of interesting, a little scary. Basically what happened is they had a huge, rain season in Africa, basically like an El Nino type of situation. There was a lot of flooding. And because of all this water, there was a fungus that infected a lot of the cacao crop. So the the crop was effectively decimated. And the result of this, of course, like I said, we're not getting our cacao from Africa. You might think it's not going to affect you. The, the, The fact is that when you take out a huge chunk of the supply of cacao in the world, basic supply and demand, people are loving chocolate as much as ever, but you make way less of it. Now there's an imbalance and it skyrocketed the price. Basically, historically, going back decades, the price has hovered around $2,500 to $3,000 per um, per ton of, you know, like the, the, the basic cheapest chocolate or cacao beans. And it's then skyrocketed up to 10,000. So just went absolutely through the roof. It's back down now and it's hovering between seven and 8,000. So I hope that things continue to to right themselves. Otherwise, it's going to make for some expensive chocolate bars in the future. But already the the big mainstream chocolate companies have said they're looking to see how they can use less cacao in their bars, as if that was even possible because of this kind of a situation. Well, and like I said before, I don't even know how much chocolate's still in there. So even less. Mm. The, more right. reason, more reason to go after products like yours. Now, one of the things that you had mentioned about the wild, the like, cacao beans from the wild, was interesting because I don't think I've ever heard about that. Right? It's it's different to me. I'm I'm used to hearing like the fair trade farms and you know, blah blah blah. My lingo's right. probably off. But how how does Ecuador give like permits to folks to harvest these? How how does it work? Just just out of curiosity, when it's a wild grown product. 
Yeah, so so they have uh, agreements with the local governments about who who can go and, and access certain uh, wildlands, basically. And you're totally right that fair trade is is an important question. It's more of an issue though for Africa, where the the child slave labor thing is a big deal. Um, it doesn't tend to be so much an issue in Central and South America in that regard. And what happens with this cacao is that the people who are collecting it are making many multiple times of fair trade wages because when the cacao is of such high quality, they can then sell it on at a much higher price. And so that has a, a great ripple effect for them in terms of being able to make a nice living. Okay. Okay. No, it's important for me to, you know, to understand too, because of course, when I want to buy something, I want to use my dollars to help folks and help the environment help, you know, I want my money to make a difference as much as it makes a difference for me, right? Especially yeah. in in the the chocolate because it's going to be medicine, right? I want the energy to be good is what right. I'm and saying. One thing on the environmental front that's really cool that um, I should probably talk more about, I don't mention that often, is that this is incentivizing the local people to protect these wild lands and these wild rainforest areas. Whereas a lot of local people in South America are incentivized in the other direction to, to go in the direction of tearing it all down for mining and logging, et cetera. Here, you're giving people a great financial incentive through paying them for the world's highest quality cacao, a really good price to protect these lands. So it's a really, really beautiful thing. That is huge. That is, you don't think about it, you know, and, and sometimes when you sit down, you know, and think about your food source, right? And you just think about, I got it at the store. You don't think about who, you know, all the things like that contributed to you getting that particular product. The same goes with the herbs in, in your products. I'm curious, you know, cordyceps, the different different types of mushrooms, things of that nature. Where are you sourcing from? Give us a scoop, kind of how you find, like, how do you find your your sources? What are your criteria? Kind of what what are you thinking in, in your mind when you're looking at besides the beans, all of the herbs? Yeah. So one of the the first principles that we start with and try to adhere to whenever possible, which is like 98% of the time, is the Tao. And this is an old Taoist principle that basically means native. But what it suggests is that you want to source something from the area in which it evolved in. Because if something evolved to grow in, in one specific mountain region originally, and then it was you know, brought to other places, it evolved for tens of thousands of years, if not longer, in that one place to be its strongest and adapted to that particular exact climate. So if you get it from there, that's going to be optimal. So that's the idea, is that we're going to the places where things are coming from. So if it's ashwagandha, we're going to India. If it is reishi mushroom, we're going to Chiang Mai Mountain in China. If it's Thai black ginger, of course, that's going to be coming from Thailand. Also, another one we get from Thailand is blue butterfly flower. Chaga, you can get chaga grown in Europe. You can get chaga grown in North America. But you can get chaga grown in, in, in mountains in China. The most powerful is what's coming from Siberia. So that's where our chaga comes from. And so we go to the place where each one is going to have the greatest level of potency. And all of our suppliers, you know, we've worked with for many, many years and have really put them through the gamut in terms of the third party testing. And we're always continuously testing to make sure that they're staying on top of their game and, and never getting sneaky with us. <laughs> Huge, you know, and, and I think a lot of people this day and age, unfortunately, Asia's kind of got a bad rap. Same thing with India in terms of growing. And and so I always try to highlight when folks are looking at companies and testing, you know, you're testing yourself. They're not testing. You're making sure, you know, nothing's no shenanigans in that. Right. Right. Absolutely. And it's um, it's it's exciting to me just to think about all these magical things coming from around the world, landing into one little bar of chocolate and then people getting to experience it like that. Because the reason I started putting the herbs in the chocolate was that. I'm so excited about these herbs, but they have quite bitter flavors a lot of the time, which our Western palate has not really been trained to enjoy through just the foods that we grew up eating. The, the bitter compounds have very much been bred out of our Western food supply. So not many people are having like a dandelion. They're having a romaine lettuce. So they don't know what it would taste like in a more wild form of a lettuce. Yeah. And so I thought, okay, what are we going to do? How are we going to get people to be okay with this? The funny thing is, 
chocolate is kind of the one bitter food that people are somehow okay with. <laughs> and so I thought, well, what if we put these in there? You can camouflage a lot of these bitter flavors inside the chocolate bar and people will be none the wiser from a flavor perspective. Mm -hmm. It's true. It's it's a easy it's an easy hide on a lot of them. Um, you can't. I'll I'll say from from trying your products, it is hard to identify the herb flavors on their own. I really have to, you know, get in there and really right, right. It let, let it tongue. let it let it melt slowly on your tongue. You're doing it the right way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so you know, I of course, folks, you guys here are listening. I I didn't even I obviously in the intro I mentioned, but addictive wellness chocolates. I mean, these are not meant like we've discussed to just wolf them down. The idea is to enjoy it and get the flavors. And, and really, I see it as kind of making contact with your herbs, like getting the energy from the herbs and just kind of getting that connection to them. Yeah, get the connection to them, get the absorption going through your mucous membranes in your mouth. So things are going to start hitting you a little bit faster. And I would say to someone who's wondering, okay, how am I supposed to eat the chocolate? Take a yeah. bite of it. Kind of pop it in your on keep it on your tongue if you can handle that, uh, like patience wise, or pop it in your cheek. Let it come up to body temperature for minimum sixty seconds before you take another bite. And that next, and if you can wait even longer, if you can hypothetically just let the whole thing melt and have extreme patience, the best. But the longer you wait, the more magical that first bite is going to be. Hey, health junkies, if your feet aren't happy and healthy, the rest of you could suffer from low back pain all the way up to neck pain. And yes, even gut issues can be related to your feet because your feet are connected to your nervous system. Happy feet equal one less thing the nervous system has to worry about. I want to tell you about Paluva. This is a new zero drop minimalist shoe with the distinctive five toe design. Paluvas give you the most authentic barefoot style experience, but with sufficient cushioning to use in everyday movement, fitness, and athletic activities. Paluvas are super stylish, so you also get a barefoot shoe that looks good too. Paluvas are a step ahead of every other zero drop wide box shoe because they feature separate slots for each of your five toes. So if you've been using toe separators, you can ditch them and just wear the paluvas. Those individual slots for each toe allow for correct dynamic movement of the foot through the walking or running stride, which is important when toes are encased in a single box, even a wide box. Now, minimalist shoes have faced controversy in recent years about causing injuries from inappropriate use. So you want to get walking in paluvas, living in paluvas, and doing whatever you can while you're going barefoot in your home and safe areas as much as possible. So go ahead and use your specialized running shoes, basketball shoes, work boots, high heels when you need to, but wear paluvas as much as possible to reawaken the natural functionality of the human foot to stand, walk, run, and perform. Try a pair of Paluvas with no risk and you'll quickly realize that these are the most comfortable shoes you've ever worn. They're designed to feel like you're walking barefoot on clouds. So visit Paluva, P-E-L-U-V-A dot com and take 15% off with the code HEALTHFIX. Let's get back to the podcast. So now that you've described that, let's talk about some of the let's talk about the the tonic nature that you you brought to each and every one of the chocolates because each and every one has herbs that I would think of would make sense like especially the love chocolate Damiana in there. I mean, this is like a in the moment kind of thing too. So let's talk about that one first. Sure. So in our chocolates, instead of having different flavors as so many chocolate companies will have, you know, you'll have a a mint, maybe you have a cayenne chocolate, an almond chocolate, a hazelnut, whatever. I wanted to go a different direction because I have this deep passion for traditional herbal systems of indigenous cultures, especially the systems of Ayurveda and also uh, Taoist tonic herbalism, I think is my, my number one area of love. So I wanted to really feature these and have the chocolate bars be focused on them in a way that would inspire people to learn more about these individual herbs, to understand them, and maybe even end up later trying them individually and developing a one-on-one -on -one relationship with each of these herbs. Mm -hmm. So I wanted the chocolates, instead of having flavors, to have functions. So each of our chocolates has a specific herbal formulation for a different function. So as you mentioned, love chocolate. So in here, some of the stars of the show are gelatinized maca, which is a famous 
aphrodisiac, but also very supportive of energy and endurance and oxygen utilization. Then we have cystanch. This is coming from China and helps to direct blood flow south of the border, which is just as important for women as it is for men. You also need blood flow for really healthy sensitivity. Mm -hmm. And also is a, just the a, uh, yang jing fiery kidney adrenal tonic. So that's in the Taoist system is where you really have the sexual energy as they would call it. And so it's, it's a classic sex tonic. Mm -hmm. And then we have black ginger from Thailand and black ginger does a lot of things. It helps protect the brain from the negative effects of stress. It helps turn on fat metabolism and, and uh, build brown fat in the body, which is is great for the mitochondrial density. It helps with energy and, and exercise performance and endurance, but it also is a phosphodiesterase inhibitor. Also, those blue pills, also phosphodiesterase inhibitors. Now, you're not going to get as overt a reaction to this necessarily as you would with something of pharmaceutical concentrations but it still is working in that direction. So what it does is phosphodiesterase effectively limits how much your blood vessels can dilate. If you limit or remove phosphodiesterase in the equation, your blood vessels can dilate more. So this is uh, removing the limiting factor when it comes to circulation. So for, for guys, of course, it's tremendous. Mm -hmm. uh, for, for women as well, though, as I said, good circulation means more sensitivity and reactivity. And then in here, we also have Hoshu Wu. So this is a yin jing sex tonic, which means it's a little bit more replenishing because for guys, the the loss of fluids during this time can be depleting as well as it was seen in the Taoist health philosophy. So in the ideal world, guys learn how to have non-ejaculatory orgasms and, and multiple orgasms. But in the meantime, you want to make sure that you are replenishing yourself, replenishing that core kidney adrenal essence and not getting to a place where you're you're placing stress on your HPA axis just because you're out there having too much of a good time. And then we also have reishi in here because reishi is the herb of immortality and spiritual potency. And this does two things. One, it's getting you out of your head and into your heart, out of thinking and into feeling because people have such stressful lives. Sometimes switching gears into romance can be a little bit tricky. Mm -hmm. And then it's just, it's, it's heart opening. It's really helping to create that connection with the other person on a heart level. So it's not just a, you know, a base chakra experience. That makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. The, the way that the herbs are set up in each of the chocolates, you know, I was looking through them and going, okay, this makes a lot of sense. So let's, let's talk about Taoist tonic herbalism for, for a little bit so that folks can kind of really get the background with the energy balance of hot and cold yin and yang, things of that nature. Give us kind of like a I guess like from the perspective of why we would want to take a tonic versus, you know, why not take just a supplement for a protocol like I mentioned in the beginning? Sure. So there's three classes of herbs as it was seen in China and by the Taoists. The one class is poisons. You reserve this for your enemies and that's about it. You don't give it to people that you care about. The second class is the medicinal herbs. This is something that, as you said, you would put in a protocol that you do for a short to medium term period to address a particular health condition or a particular imbalance. And then you would stop because long term, there could potentially be some negative side effects that would build up. Then you have this elite class of the tonic herbs. These are herbs that you can use short to medium term to sort things out, but you can also really use them long term in small amounts daily over the course of your life to build this foundation of radiant health upon which you can build an extraordinary life. And so with these herbs, that you have the concept of yin and yang. Some herbs like hoshu wu is a more yin herb. Sistanch is a more yang herb in some of the ones that we've talked about. And so yin being cooling and replenishing, yang being more fiery and expenditure of energy. And you, of course, want to establish balance. And so somebody who tends to be more yin by nature will benefit from having some more yang herbs. Somebody who tends to be more yang and high intensity by nature will benefit from having some more yin herbs like hoshu wu to calm things down, replenish, bring you into a, a, a more a more of a state of equilibrium. But then the what I have always found the most romantic and incredible about the Taoist system is the concept of the three treasures. And they traditionally would use the metaphor of a candle to describe these. Uh, in the modern world, I find it helps a little bit more to use a financial metaphor. So they say your life is made up of the three treasures. And these are Jing, 
chi, and shen. And in the metaphor of the candle, the wax and the wick is the jing. This is your core essence. It's your core kidney adrenal vitality. One might also say it's the health of your HPA axis in, in the modern medical understanding. In the financial metaphor, this is your savings account. And so everybody comes into life with a certain amount of jing that we've inherited from our parents. And this is based on how healthy our ancestors were, what their lifestyle was like. Were they already on to processed foods for our parents and grandparents, or were they eating more of an ancestral nutrient dense diet, in which case they have a bit more vitality that they can pass on to us. And of course, what prenatal nutrition was like is also going to affect this as well. And I look at this as that is your what's called prenatal jing. And this is like your trust fund. Some people come into life with a big fat trust fund and of energy, and they never have to really worry about taking care of their health. These are the ones who they they they, they drink and smoke, and and they're still sort of pretty healthy. And they make fun of people like us for actually having to be active in taking care of our health. They say, "Look at me, I drink, I smoke, I'm fine," you know. But then they, of course, tend to hit hit a wall at a certain point and suddenly die of a heart attack because. They never learn to sense when their jing is running out. And when your jing runs out, that's the end of this lifetime. So they just suddenly go off that cliff and that's the end. Whereas somebody who's more yin slowly loses their energy through life. And, and if somebody starts out with not as much jing, you know, maybe you didn't get that trust fund because you didn't inherit this foundation of health from your parents. So you have less. And so you have to be more careful with what you have. You have to really budget your expenditure of energy and how much you're going to party and how much you're going to stay up late. These things, any kind of excessive living is going to deplete your jing at an accelerated rate. So you're always using it up little by little. But if you're stressing hard, if you're not sleeping well, if you're doing drugs and alcohol, having a poor diet, these things are all called jing leaks. It's where you're just like pouring it out um, without without really thinking about the long term. And so people who start out with not much jing tend to have to really take care of it. And so they tend to not die suddenly. They tend to slowly fade out because they're using it at a slower pace. And so that's jing. It's your savings account. And if you are constantly pulling from your savings account to live, that's not a sustainable way of living. It's not going to really work out long term. Then you have the second treasure. This on the candle is the active part of the candle. It's the flame. In the financial metaphor, it's your checking account. This is the chi. This is where you do your daily deposits and withdrawals. Chi is something that you accumulate through proper rest. It's something that you accumulate from basically the air you breathe and the food you eat. It's that active energy. And if you are making lots of chi, if you have lots of inflow coming into your checking account, you don't have to worry about dipping into your savings. And that's a much more sustainable way to live. However, if you're not eating well, you're not sleeping well, you're not generating chi, you have to rely on that savings account. And this is like when you see people who are addicted to caffeine and just cannot go through the day without five to 10 cups of coffee, for example. Coffee, look, in the, in the the if it's clean sourced and if it's uh, very high quality and done in moderation, it can be a total superfood. But if you are dependent on it like this, it means that you're not making enough chi. You're relying on coffee as an adrenal stimulant to force you to dip into those savings, dip into those savings. And it's not a superb long-term strategy. Whereas if you're generating abundant chi, you're living sustainably and it's going to be a, a very awesome life. Then the third treasure is what's called the ultimate treasure. This is your shen because the purpose of a candle is not just to have a big flame. It's to give off a great light. The purpose of life is not just to have a big fat checking account. It's to have a beautiful impact on the community around you. So Shen, this is the light that the candle gives off. It's the light in your eyes. It's your spirit. It's your higher self. It's your ability to, to bring light into others' lives. And the financial metaphor, this, if you get a great, if your savings account is doing really well, if your checking account is doing really well, what do you do? You set up a nonprofit to benefit those around you. And so there are herbs that specifically work on each of these treasures. We talked about Sistanch and Hoshu Wu. These are great uh, jing tonic herbs. And some herbs do more than one treasure. Cordyceps mushroom or cordyceps fungus, this is working on both jing and chi. Then we talk about reishi mushroom. It's a rare three treasure tonic herb, meaning it's working on jing, chi, and shen. So the idea is you build these three treasures and this creates 
basically, if you think of your life, sorry to switch metaphors, but if you think of your life as a house, these treasures are the foundation of the house. If you have a house with a strong foundation, when a big storm comes through, when things get crazy in your life, you're going to have a strong foundation. You're going to be steady and things are going to happen around you, but you're not going to be thrown off balance. Whereas if your foundation is rickety and and you've been uh, stealing from your foundation and selling the parts just because you weren't having enough money. You've been like, you know, selling the cement from the foundation of your house because you needed a few extra bucks here and there. Okay. Now, when this storm comes through, you're going to be in real trouble because you've, uh, if I could switch metaphors again, you, your tree has not, doesn't have the deep roots to keep itself solid. <laughs> Sorry, I'm all over the place with that one, but sticking to the house, like you want to build this strong foundation so that when the storm comes, because it will, we all are going to experience some craziness, some hecticness, some tragedy at some point in our lives. You want to be solid and and not be completely crushed by it all. Makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. You know, and that's kind of where I see tonics as they're like your foundation, but they're also your support. A lot of folks are familiar now with adaptogenic herbs and I, and that's why there are in a lot of your, your chocolates, but they're also yeah. the, the main thing is a tonic. And so I really want folks to, to understand that like, this isn't meant to be like, oh, I need more focus. So I'm going to take Sage's cho chocolate focus and I'm going to do it for like a month and I'm going to better focus and then I can stop it. And then it's, it's going to magically stay. It's meant. Right. It's, it's, there's various stages of experiences with these herbs mm -hmm. for a lot of people. The first experience can actually be pretty awesome. And I, and I love that first experience because I think humans don't really sense speed. They sense acceleration. So mm -hmm. if you're driving, you could be going 85 miles an hour on the freeway and it doesn't feel that fast. You're just going. Whereas if you're going zero to 60 in two seconds in a modern ultra high performance car, whoa, your head goes to the back of the seat and you feel that with herbs I, and, and health in general, people get used to whatever stage of health they're at. And it's the shift that is what they notice the most. It's when they they come back to you after, you know, maybe a month on some of your protocols and they say, wow, like it, this feels so different. I have so much more energy. Eventually they'll forget about that extra energy and it just becomes their new normal. It's hedonic adaptation. But when somebody has a first experience with an herb and it, and it can sometimes it create a pretty immediate shift in them, it's so exciting for me to see because that is what I think drives people to, to keep at it and, and keep wanting to stay at that speed after you've been going after, after you go fast, you don't want to slow back down. You, once you've had a little taste of how good life can be with some of the most amazing substances coming into your body, you don't want to go back. And so there's that experience. And then over the first, I would say four to 12 weeks, you're certainly going to see a buildup of benefits. In most cases, this is usually the period of time over which studies are done on these herbs. It's rare to see, you know, long-term studies done over many years. It's usually in the four to six week range. And so I tell people at least take an herb for a month before you come to any conclusions about whether it's working for you or not, unless you're having, you know, a rare side effect to it, of course, discontinue and speak with a practitioner. But in, in most cases, at least do it for a month, if not two or three to really get the the kind of experience that you would see in a study and then understand that long-term benefits are going to even continue to build further and further into the future. Makes sense. Makes sense. So, I mean, that being said, of course, guys, I'm going to reveal my favorite of all of Sage's is the energy one. I love that one. And then focus was second. And mm -hmm. and probably that's where I need, you know, I, I feel like the herbs call to you because you need them, you know, and you need to keep them going and go. And, and so, my my question to you is, what's your favorite out of all of yours? Which one are are you kind of drawn to right now, or did you have one? But you know, have you kind of it goes went through, through? It goes through phases. Yeah. It goes through phases, yeah. and because I'm of course have been blessed to be able to create this life for myself with a an, an a infinite amount of chocolate, all I could eat every single day. <laughs> so I have I have options, which I'm just like incredibly blessed for, and. So I would say at the moment, focus is my number one because work intensity is is quite high at the moment. There'll be periods where I cycle through basically all of them though, depending on what's going on. If it's a, if it's a romantic night, it's a love chocolate. If I'm working a lot, focus, as I said, 
If I'm working out or going surfing, okay, energy chocolate is going to be the go-to. If I've been burning the candle at both ends a bit too much, I need to build back that jing. We have a chocolate called Recharge. It's all the best jing supportive herbs. Uh, if it's, uh, you know, sometimes I'll be really like, okay, let's work on my skin health. Okay, now we're talking beauty chocolate. Mm -hmm. And, and we just, immunity is always important, especially in the, in the past years, um, to always be on top of your immunity. So, so we've got one for that. And it's just, um, I, like you said, you listen to your body and see what it's asking for at the time. And that's also a part of what I love about having the functional chocolates is it gets people to at least spend a moment when they're either on the website or standing in front of the shelf in the health food store saying, oh, I'm not just thinking about what I want to taste. I need to think about what I want to experience and get in touch with my body and where I need to improve things and what I need to cultivate. So it gets people, I hope, to have a little bit more of the body awareness that can be such a great tool for, for addressing and supporting their health long term. I I hope so. I mean, when I look at this, all of your products and I look at everything and I go, oh, my gosh, how genius. Right. Because now we're taking and you. and you have it on your little flap there. Like, isn't it? May all your addictions be beneficial. Is that what exactly? Yeah. Oh, okay. good memory. Yes. You've been taking the focus chocolate. <laughs> I, I have been trying. I have been trying. Um, but yeah, that to me is if you're going to have an addiction, you might as well make it benefit you because so many people I know are reaching for chocolate every day. So why not spend a little bit more? on a higher quality chocolate, that is your tonic. So this is your medicine, right? That's absolutely. And uh, the funny thing about the word addiction as well, because it kind of throws some people for a loop yeah. is that originally it comes from the Latin addictionum. And this was traditionally used to mean de to be devoted as in devoted to one's loved ones or one's God. And it wasn't until heroin came into the picture and people began to have this devotional relationship to the drug heroin that people switched this and it's like oh he's devoted to heroin he's addicted to heroin and that is when we lost the the beautiful side of the the addiction idea but our, our thought is yes you can we should be able to get you addicted to stuff that you're is really good for you but also at the same time uh we would like you with addictive wellness we want you to be devoted to your wellness and have that be something that you put effort and, and attention and focus into cultivating i like that i like that a lot so if someone's thinking right now sage they're like hmm you have a lot of different types of of chocolates that you offer and different purposes. Where where do you have folks start? Like what's entry level? And you you know, all of the chocolates guys are like four four squares. So there's not a lot there. So I'm curious as to how you recommend like someone get started and how they dive into your chocolates. Where where is the starting point? For a lot of people, they'll look at the the different functions and one will jump out at them. And you go with that because everybody's body is so unique. Your state of health is so unique. What you're going through in your life is unique. So I won't be able to tell you which is the perfect <laughs> one for you. If you're overwhelmed by all this talk of adaptogens <laughs> and tonic herbs, and you're but somehow you're still listening to this, there is one called Pure, which has no herbs in it. And we primarily made this for people who are not ready for the herbs or more specifically for pregnant and breastfeeding women who need to simplify things and, and not be consuming um, too many exotic herbs at this time. Mm -hmm. And then look at what is going to suit your life. I think you can never go wrong with any of these in the sense that it's always great to have a healthy brain with a focused chocolate. It's always great to have chi production with energy, recharge chocolate. It's good to build your jing, um, immunity chocolate, to fortify your defenses. There's, there's not a wrong way to go. So just try to listen to your body and see what it's asking for. And then you try one. And like we were talking about, take one bite out of it and then let it melt in your mouth. And at least give it 60 seconds before you take the second bite with your molars there into it and have that experience of the different flavor notes in the cacao. And then you'll start to detect some of the different interesting, more uh, dynamic flavors coming through from the different herbs in there. And then just be present with that experience and and pay attention to how it affects you. And then maybe next time you want to try a different one, or maybe you try a variety pack and, uh, you know, you, you get them all and work your way through it. And now you've been introduced to a bunch of different herbs and suddenly, you know, quite a bit about adaptogens and you can tell people I've had stanch, I've had maca, I've had, you know, uh, ashwagandha, I've had Thai black ginger and blue butterfly. You're going to dive right in the deep end and it's going to be awesome. <laughs> I like that. I like that. So 
I'm I'm imagining, right? Someone's got their chocolate. They take a bite, right? They're they're kind of just letting it roll around on their tongue because I I like the idea of experiencing the herbs. I mean, that's what I've wanted people to do forever because I feel like that's the way that you'll commit to using herbs to take care of your health um, or manage your health, if you will, or or boost your health, whatever word you want to use. But for one square, what's the average time that you take to consume one one square of your chocolate? It depends on my state of mind at the time. So okay. I, as much as I talk about it's good to let it dissolve and this kind of stuff, sometimes I am um, a little bit too aggressive, I, even I, and I just get right into biting it and it's maybe a 30 second experience. However, most of the time I will try to take that bite, pop it in my cheek, warm it up for one to two minutes. And then if I'm really feeling the Zen, I will just let it sit on my tongue and just dissolve, dissolve, dissolve. But usually I'll give it that one to two minutes warm up. And then I'll, as it becomes a little more soft and fudgy, I'll enjoy that biting into it experience from there. Nice. I was curious, the, the focus one, I kind of was like writing when I was taking that one, just to, you know, enhance the experience. And so I was sure. doing the same kind of thing, take a little bite, let it sit, get the herbs in, write a little bit. And take another one. It took me probably like five minutes to finish one of them. Oh yeah, and yeah. It was like the most glorious chocolate experience. So I, I really want. I, obviously, we've I've mentioned this like six times because <laughs> I really want folks to understand that like you don't need to mow your chocolate. Like take your time, get the herbs in, and I do believe like the it gets in better that way. Absolutely, absolutely. And people find with this chocolate that they're satisfied with a much smaller amount. Mm -hmm. If you look at, it was funny when we were creating the labels originally for our chocolates that we we worked with a, an FDA labeling consultant in, in the beginning of our business to make sure everything was compliant. And a point that he said was, you're not using the correct FDA serving size because the FDA serving size is 50 grams, which is more than even one bar of our whole bar of our chocolate. But very, very rarely were people finding it you know, important to have that much or finding that they had desire to have that much. They max out on one or two pieces very frequently. Mm -hmm. Some people have a whole bar and that's totally fine too, but it just wasn't the common thing. And so we kind of just dug our heels and said, no, we're leaving it at half a bar is going to be a serving because that's what the reality is of what people are doing yeah. um, and, and feeling really good with it. So it's, it, it tends to, because of the nutritional density of this cacao, because it's not something that's, you know, 40 or 50% sugar, that's not going to give you any real deep satisfaction. This is healthy fats, cacao, antioxidants, polyphenols, um, prebiotic fibers, and then you add in the herbs and uh, keep it all sugar free at the same time. So that you can, this is the big thing for me as I was getting into chocolate making too, is that I was dealing with um, the consequences of having taken antibiotics a lot earlier in my life. There was a period of five years where I was taking daily antibiotics mm. and I had Candida come in on the tail end of that and, and take over as my gut microbiome had basically been wiped out. And so I had to figure out how to have something that was sugar-free because even though there were some pretty cool chocolates out there that were in the healthy direction, you could only have so much, even if it was like a coconut sugar or a maple sugar at a certain point, you say, okay, that's too much sugar. I'm, I'm going to give myself a Candida flare up here and my skin's going to let me know about this real quick. So I thought... I need to make this sugar free to remove that ceiling of chocolate enjoyment. So you can have all the chocolate you want and not be stressing on the sugar front. So um, we sweeten our chocolate with a combination of organic allulose and organic monk fruit. So you get a really nice natural sweet flavor without uh, affecting your blood sugar in any way and, and feeding into any kind of sugar sensitive conditions that so many people have. It's hugely important. I, I have, a lot of patients that struggle with the skin stuff with the candida and and just gut stuff too it's so important and um we had mentioned that you everything's stevia free now because we had had one that was had some stevia and so for folks who are worried about the stevia flavor you do not have stevia in anything right for many years now. many years we did uh stevia and xylitol as, as our sweeteners um and then as more new options have become available we've transitioned um, actually, just this week, we've completed the the final transition into our new formulation of allulose and monk fruit, which people are enjoying even more. So I'm I'm very excited for people to experience it. 
Oh my goodness. Sage, such great stuff here. I love the chocolates. I mean, I had to, I had to nail down some favorites, but probably because of what it was going on in life at the time when I was trying them all. But I have no doubt that I could easily have a pack of all of them and just kind of choose like, what am I feeling today and keep the tonic benefit going throughout the the week. So gosh, great stuff. Thank you so Thank much you. for coming on and chatting all about addictive wellness and oh, these chocolates. My pleasure. I'm excited to to share this podcast. I was so excited when I got your samples. So this is fun stuff. It's, thank you for giving me the opportunity. As you can tell, I get pretty excited about this stuff. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to share my fashion. Oh, my pleasure. Hey, Health Junkies. Thank you so much for listening to another episode of the Health Fix podcast. To help support my mission to bring you tips, tricks, and tools to help you optimize your health, I'd be grateful if you'd like, subscribe, and write me a review for the podcast. And if you hear a product you're interested in on the podcast, you can now go over to my website to learn more. That's doctor spelled out, J-K-R-A-U-S-E-N-D.com. Just click on shop and you'll find all the information on my favorite products that I stand behind and use myself. All affiliate income earned with your purchases goes directly to help support the production of the podcast so I can keep bringing you quality health information. I appreciate your support and I'm honored to have you listening to my podcast as a fellow health junkie. Thanks again.